Hi, Margo, and hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and, and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I am Cindy Orozco Borges, and I'm from the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering here at Semper. And uh, it's a great institute that if any of you are looking for a PhD program, definitely please come here. So today I will talk about optimization. And when I I started to learn optimization here when I started my PhD. I thought that optimization was this set of algorithms that allowed us to find minimums of objective functions. And that is what I learned in my first class. But then as time passed, I realized that most of the time that I was spending wasn't in the algorithm, was more on how to implement those algorithms and how to pass those algorithms into machines and into scaling up into big machines, into big data. And that is a very interesting talk that I can give you, but another time, and definitely I, I recommend you to visit the uh, WITS workshops. Uh, there are amazing talks there where we can dive more into the implementation. But as the time passed, I realized that the most difficult part of optimization is not really neither the algorithm or the implementation. It's really defining your problems and why it is so important or so hard to to work on defining your problems or defining your um uh, how to transform your knowledge into an equation is that it's not just a matter of defining your write your question but also putting that into mathematical equations that you can make sure that if you solve those equations, then you will find the ground truth, the real solution that you were looking for to solve your problem. And it's not just a matter of defining equations, it's also a matter of making equations that can connect very nicely with the algorithms and with the implementation that is existed up to today. And how do we define those problems and how do we define those equations well, actually, there is not such a very clear path. It's something that I call an informed crowdsourcing. Literally, we just look at what other people have done. We kind of copy more or less the approach of other people, and we see how other, person, other people have solved similar problems than the ones that we have solved, and we adapt those to our problems. But what is the problem with that approach? What is the problem of just copying what other people have done? Is that we don't know if things work for our specific problem. So when we talk about robust optimization or robust algorithms is that when we define those equations, when we define those loss functions, we want to make sure that those loss functions work for a wide range of data sets. For, so if I'm copying something that someone else did, there is a high chance chance that it will work also for my problem because it works for a wide range of data sets. And therefore, how do we do that in practice? In practice, we just take a loss function and we try if it works for our data set and we try it with different data sets until we discover that it doesn't work. The problem there is that we don't know if it generalizes for a data set that we haven't seen. We just try it and if it works great but we always have that small question inside us to know it really works for everything and when we compare that with our approach in theory but when we learn optimization when we we learn that we can analyze the properties of the equations we can learn the the properties of the optimization landscape how these functions behave and derive things from theory that tells us if things work or not so when we put together these two approaches, they are a little bit contradictory because we don't know exactly how the theory uh, like comes to life. The truth is, and, and, and what not a lot of people tell us is that the theory doesn't come out of the blue. Actually, to develop that theory, we just do a lot of numerical experiments first until we find patterns that we want to explain. And if there are patterns that we can identify in these numerical experiments, then there is a chance that probably there exists theory or we can develop theory that can explain those patterns. So with that approach of first trying things a lot of times and then developing the theory is the thing that I want to talk today, the problem that I want to talk today to you about. So let's suppose that you have two data sets in a sphere or 
in, in a, any dimension a sphere. In here, I just put a 3D sphere, but it can be many dimensions. And your data sets just satisfy any distribution that you can imagine. What is the only property that I ask for these data sets is that for every point in your first data set, xi, there is another point in your uh, other data set, yi, such that there exists a linear transformation that maps one data set into the other. You know exactly the pairs between the points, but you don't know that linear transformation. Because you are you're in the spheres, then you don't want to deform the sphere. So the linear transformation has to be a rotation, or at least you ask for it to be a rotation. And that is what we call a point set registration problem. So the idea is, how do we find that rotation? So right now, I should ring a bell to you in your minds and you say, oh, finding a linear regression, like a linear transformation, that sounds like linear regression. And actually, it is. If we use least squares, but we restrict ourselves to find a rotation instead of just any linear mapping, then we are solving the problem of point set registration. How we can find a solution there? Well, actually, for those of you that know DSVD or DPCA, that decomposition, that matrix decomposition, helps us to define this rotation. And in particular, there is a specific decomposition called the polar decomposition that give us back the rotation that we are looking for. When our data is extremely clean, we can get up to machine precision, and then we are solving our problem. The reality is that our data is not actually always clean. Sometimes our pairs are corrupted, meaning that a portion of our pairs are matching perfectly, but another portion of our pairs are totally at random, and xi doesn't have anything to do with yi. So when we apply this linear regression model into this corrupted model, we get an error of 10 to the minus 2. So we lose that machine precision error, and well, it's not so great. So our approach was, what if we define a new loss function that can give us a better result? And the proposal that we did was something called least and squares uh, loss. So meaning you just take least squares, you remove the squares out of the terms that you are adding up, and that is called least and squares. When we apply to our corrupted data, we get an error of 10 to the minus 4. And then that is way better. However, what is, the, what is the caveat here is that optimizing over the rotations is like if you were optimizing on a circle. You need to work, walk in arches. And we only know how to walk in a straight lines in optimization. So it's kind of difficult to solve this problem right away. A middle point between the two is to solve the problem not just, let's say, in the boundary of the circle, so just in the rotations, but also inside of the circle. And that is something called the convex hull of the rotations. And in there, we can walk in the straight lines. So optimization, the algorithms in optimization are way easier solving it in this bigger space. However, when we solve it in this bigger space, this loss function, the error that we get is 10 to the minus 1. So we look at this panorama and we say, OK, we have three different uh, loss functions which one should I use? Because each of them are working in completely different ways. So the next step is try things until they don't work out. And for that, we need to identify what things can I vary in order to find patterns. So we have three different uh, uh, loss functions, but at the same time, we have different sample sizes, and we have a different corruption model. So if we play around with corruption models and sample sizes, maybe we can find those patterns. And that's what we did. However, if we start with our own data, our own data is very specific, and it cannot be generalized to a probabilistic model. So let's leave our data in a site, and let's generate a probabilistic model. In here, just for a quick observation, green means that you recover your rotation exactly, and yellow means that you have an error of 10 to the minus 1. So you will notice that for different sample sizes, you have a completely different behavior between the three different algorithms. So not always increasing the sample size helps you to recover your rotation. 
And that goes a little bit counterintuitive to what we always think that a larger sample size will give us a better result. But all of this is numerical. The big question is, can we explain this with theory? And the truth is, yes, we can. So how do we go around explaining these things with theory? So first, we need to make sure that the loss function that we propose is going to recover our ground truth. In the case of linear regression, that only happens when we have an infinite sample size. And that means when we can prove it in expectation. But in reality, we don't have an infinite sample size. We have a finite sample size. And in there, only least and squares loss works. And when we are solving it for a rotation, it works for any corruption if we have a large enough sample size. But when we have, when we are solving it in an easier domain in the convex hole, if there is this treasure of 0 0.58 that if the corruption is above that model, it doesn't work. So the next question that you should ask is, wait, why do we have these three different behaviors? And the truth is, it's not enough to have a minimum. We need to have a robust minimum, meaning that we cannot perturb it. And why there is this different behavior between the three algorithms is because for linear regression, things are extremely smooth at the minimum, meaning that it's very easy to move it because the derivative around the minimum is close to zero. So it's very easy to change that very close to zero to zero. But in the least of squares, you have that the, at the minimum, the derivative is not continuous. Therefore, it's very hard to change something that is far from zero to get it closer to zero. And that's why it is robust. It's a robust minimum there. And what happens with that threshold of 0 0.58? That is a threshold between our loss function becoming from easy to hard to perturb. And in here, the last question that we need to ask ourselves is, it's not just a matter of, is the loss function giving us, giving us the ground truth? It is like also, if can I find an algorithm that can solve this loss function that arrives to the ground truth? So can we reach the minimum? And when we have a convex function, that is this case, we need a convex domain in order to have for certainty that we will always reach the minimum. And that happens in the first two problems. But when we are solving the least and squares in the rotation space, walking in those arches makes things very complicated. And in there, we can not have certainty. So we also prove that if we can start with from any point and if we have a large enough sample size, we will reach the minimum. So at this point, you may ask, OK, you started with a very random like model. How does that work with my data? My data is usually has a different set of noise. It can have a correlation and it can have measurement errors. So how can I translate those theoretical results into my own problem? So there we go back to the approach of track things and then look at the theory. So first try things, update the model and create a probabilistic model with artificial data from your own data and ask yourself, does it work numerically? And then if it does, look at what changes in the proof and see uh, if you can extend things and kind of like find for those essential things that change the proof and if those things change in your data or not. So with this, I hope that com to convince you that it is important to spend time to understand better your loss function because it can give you better insights on what is the answer that you're getting and how to generalize those insights in your problem. But at the same time, it can give you guarantees to make sure that you can find the solution of your problem and, and make sure that the loss function that you are proposing is feasible to solve. Thank you so much.